Thank you very much, Madam Chair. And colleagues, thank you very much for your attention to the email that I sent around on this topic over the weekend. Um, as you will know from your reading, this is a report about options that we have for creating better bylaw enforcement for our McMaster neighborhoods. And I won't go into a big speech about uh, how bad it is. I won't go into a big speech about um, all the noise problems and hygiene problems in the neighborhood that are bylaw violations. I think it's, it's fairly well known uh, throughout the community that McMaster neighborhoods, Westdale and Ainsleywood, have special challenges in terms of bylaw uh, enforcement. Needless to say, other neighborhoods also have all kinds of bylaw violation problems. Um, my argument is simply that Ainsleywood and Westdale are acute cases, and because they are acute cases, uh, we need some special help for those neighborhoods. Um, so three options have been brought forward, and pursuant to my email from over the weekend, I'm in favor of the second option. The second option, uh, to boil it down, involves spending money out of our tax stabilization reserve. Sadly, I cannot use Ward 1 area rating funds. I would if I could. In order to hire a new bylaw officer whose full-time job it will be to enforce bylaw in the McMaster neighborhoods, working with all relevant stakeholders to do a good job of that. Whatever ticket money is generated through ticketing will be used to defray the cost of this bylaw officer's salary and benefits. Uh, so. I, so I know, I know it's not structured as um, uh, move a motion within the report where to receive the report. So I, I suppose, uh, Madam Chair and Madam Clerk, we receive the report and then I move my motion, or how, how would that work? Ida? No, you can move your motion instead of receiving the report. Okay. Uh, Thank you. So that is what I intend to do. Uh, the case for this motion is the severity, the real severity of the bylaw problems in this neighborhood. To, to my regret, and I, I regret this very much, McMaster University, with whom I've been in conversation on this topic for several months, is presently unable to contribute financially. What McMaster has said is that after one year of a pilot project, which is what my motion is proposing, a one-year pilot project in which tax stabilization would fund a bylaw officer for that year period, McMaster has said after that pilot project, they are um, genuinely interested in the possibility of contributing, which is of course not a guarantee, but I take McMaster at their word that that possibility exists. And to clarify, this is not an anti-McMaster moment. Uh, twice a year, McMaster pays for a blitz of bylaw enforcement in the neighborhood, uh, but, uh, particularly uh, at the key student move in and move out times when uh, particularly garbage is a problem in the neighborhoods. And McMaster also contributes to a special policing fund and ha has campus security. So I, I certainly do not want uh, the message to be misconstrued. McMaster does contribute to the community in certain ways. And of course, it's a gray area. How much should McMaster be contributing? Bluntly though, that isn't really what we're here to talk about. Um, that's a conversation for another day. Uh, McMaster is a good partner for the city. The city is a good partner for McMaster. And another day we can go into the nuts and bolts of, of that partnership. My motion uh, isn't really about McMaster at all. Uh, it's only about McMaster in that McMaster is willing to possibly contribute money in the future. And to get this one-year pilot project off the ground, uh, we need funds from tax stabilization reserve. The matter would be deferred to our uh, budget process coming up because that's what we do with tax stabilization uh, expenditure proposals. Um, and I would in earnest ask for your support. And I'm, I'm pleased to talk about it, receive any questions or concerns. For those who feel they can't vote against it for fiscal constraint reasons, I will understand. My pitch to you is these neighborhoods are really suffering and we really need this in Ward 1. So thank you for your consideration. Thank you very much. Oh, and and Councillor Farr is my seconder. Thank you. Councillor Farr, thank you. And I've got someone on this side. Thank you. I've got Councillor Collins first, please. Thanks, uh, Madam Chairman. And I certainly don't uh, dispute the fact that uh, Councillor Johnson has experienced problems with McMaster. It's, it's not a new issue, certainly, for the ward. And I know that his predecessor, Councillor McCaddy, was oftentimes in front of us here uh, relaying the same. Uh, issue as it relates to not just a student issue, I think, or McMaster issue that was pointed out, but there certainly are issues in Westdale and, and around the university that they experience there that, that those of us um, in other areas do not experience. The concern that I have with the motion, and I certainly don't blame the councillor for bringing it forward, uh, back in 2013, I worked with councillor McCaddy and councillor Morelli on a proactive property standards um, uh, pilot program. And if you recall, we hired a team to go out and look at not just McMaster, but Mohawk in Councillor Whitehead's area where he was dealing with the uh, college students. 
we were dealing with Councillor Morelli's absence to tea landlords that uh, had broken up a number of the older Victorian homes in Ward 3 that's now represented by Councillor Green, of course. And of course, I had the issue with high-rise apartment buildings. And so we established a pilot program that put together essentially a team of bylaw officers to go out into these areas where there are unique problems, McMaster with their own, Mohawk with their own, high-rise buildings certainly in my area and in the downtown. And that team was, uh, was essentially out there to blitz we weren't waiting for people to pick up the phone. That is essentially the current um, process that we have. They were out there to go after some of the, the worst properties um, where we had a long-standing history of property standards violations. That, that pilot program turned into a permanent program. So we still have those proactive uh, bylaw officers. That team is still out there regularly enforcing. The concern that we had when we adopted the pilot that was that it wasn't going to be for just one area of the city. I remember many of my suburban colleagues saying, if I need to call on this team to address property standards issues in my area, will they be available to be used anywhere in the city, even outside of McMaster or outside the downtown or the lower city? The answer was yes. And so that pilot program went from being a pilot program to now an established program. Again, they are not waiting for people to pick up the phone. They are out there addressing not just neighborhood issues, but individual property issues. So can, can I ask through you, the concern I had when I read this is essentially we're repeating what we've already approved with that team that's already in place. So if I could through you to ask to Marty, is that still the case that we still have this team that is addressing McMaster, Mohawk, and other areas of the city on a proactive basis, not a reactive basis? Thank you, Marty. So through the chair, uh, Councillor Collins has outlined the history uh, very well. Uh, council did approve a proactive team. We had a pilot for two or three years. It was approved by council in late 2013, early 2014. And the uh, permanent proactive program is in existence for enforcing rental housing conditions across the city. And so the, is there anything that prevents Councillor Johnson and his neighborhoods from utilizing those staff members to assist with some of the issues that he's rightly um, experiencing in, in Ward 1? Marty? So through the chair, we do proactive blitzes in, in all of the wards, including Ward 1. If the councillor wishes to focus in certain specific areas or properties, we can work with him on that. So I, I certainly have support. I will support certainly um, utilizing that team that we've paid for now for a number of years to address those issues. My concern is establishing another service level in the area, uh, uh, one area of the city, because I know what's going to come next from Councillor Whitehead. Tomorrow he's going to be here asking for a similar program for Mohawk and we'll have, you know, for the absentee landlords that exist in other areas of the city, we're going to have others requesting the same and that's why that pilot program was a city-wide program. It was available to everyone on council. If you have a hot spot in your area, you can turn to that team and they're going to address it. Those problems aren't going away. I know that it's a cat and mouse game with McMaster, Mohawk and other areas, but we saw fit to make an investment. That investment has worked. Um, it certainly worked in my area where I've had some problem spots in some of my high rises and I, I think it would work quite well for Councillor Johnson and allow us to avoid the expense here. I'd be very surprised if, in fact, if finance was supportive of utilizing a reserve, this reserve in particular, which is very low, to, to fund what's outlined here. So again, if we're into area rating, I'm certainly willing to talk about that, although it doesn't meet policy, um, but I have some concerns hiring new people, understanding that we have hired others in the past to tackle this same issue. So those are my comments. Okay. We have a list of speakers, so I'm just going to go to, and Councillor Johnson, I have you down for the second time. Councillor Pearson. Thank you, Madam Chairman, and certainly appreciate the previous speakers. Uh, certainly a thorough review of the history on, on what we brought in as far as the um, proactive enforcement of property standards and, and always supported that. I guess my question is, through you to, I guess, Marty then, if you could answer. When we do proactive enforcement um, and their rental properties, student housing, are we targeting the landlords of these properties? Are uh, notices going? Are their fines high enough? I know my mother lives in Westdale. I know what I see there every time I go up. You know, you sometimes you get, you get tired of saying, you know, you got to put the complaints in. But are we actively going after the landlords? Thank you. Marty? Through the chair, yes, we actively go after landlords. We, uh, council has approved fees for service, so for habitual chronic problems, we add fees to that. And we also regularly work with legal services to seek the appropriate fines when we go to court. Okay. Thank but, you, Councillor. And are, do we keep a log of, uh, and I want to ask here because we don't have, I'm sure there's been, we've had other 
enforcement's going on in the Westdale area. So do we have a history of um, how successful they, that has been? Because it doesn't really say that here. And I know it was mentioned Councillor McCaddy had um, uh, enforcement done as far as, I don't remember it was one year pilots, but I know there were some, some, some processes that were put in place. Thank you, Marty. So through the chair, um, I'm not sure what successful, successful means. We do have a high rate of compliance when we issue orders, uh, and we also use contractors to clean up properties, but it is a big problem. Okay, and Thank I guess you. what I'm trying to get to is, are they, are they the same properties all the time? Like, do we have a consistent um, visual that they're the same properties all the time? Thank you, Marty. So through the chair, uh, Yes, a lot of them are habitual properties, but when we really focus in on them and add the fees for service, and uh, usually they do finally comply. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And I wouldn't mind at a point once we deal with this that we ask staff, whatever goes forward, if it's proactive, that we have a log so that we know exactly what's happening. You know, are they habitual? I mean, is there a need to look at an, an elevated uh, rate schedule for fines? And I want to be very careful, Madam Chairman, and I'll say to the clerk now that as a landlord, I don't have properties in West Hill, I don't rent to students, but I want to be sure, but I think we need to address the broader issue that's going on here. So um, the other question I want to ask is with regards to the um, option three, and I know Councillor Johnson didn't raise that, but through to you to staff, what would it have cost with regards to expanding the existing Mohawk College student co-op? What's that costing us? Through the chair, through the chair to the Councillor. Um, what I can report on is the uh, program started in January 2016. We have two Mohawk College students. So from the time period from January to August 30th, the fee for services that were generated by them were 68,200 wow. approximately, and their wages are 4,200, 4, 400. So that is revenue generation of about $25,800. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, and I'll just leave it at that for the moment. I just wanted that information as, you know, I don't know why that wouldn't have been suggested as an alternative, but I'll leave it as to where the ward councillor is wanting to take this. Thank you. Councillor Green. Thank you very much, and certainly some fantastic questions that we have been unpacking at our rental licensing subcommittee. I know Councillor Johnson has done a lot of uh, work in, in exploring what a registry might look like to be able to proactively enforce uh, insufficient and, and inadequate landlord and, and tenant uh, situations. But I, I do have a question because of all the, the points that Councillor Collins brought up. Certainly we're wrestling with some major issues still in Ward 3 and I, and I would uh, agree that this needs to be citywide in its scope, but should this Councillor want to go in this direction through you, uh, Madam Chair, I, I asked quietly if, if there were any uh, Bell Mobility cell phone towers uh, in the Councillor's office that are in his uh, ward that he might be able to access as a funding source. Thank you. So through the chair, I'm seeing I can find that information right now, but I don't have it at the moment. So thank you. So I guess, you know, uh, there are a couple of non levy revenue items that we have access to that might be sufficient for a pilot should should he have that and choose to go in that direction as the ward councillor. I'm okay to explore and support that, and I don't know if maybe uh, if the councillor, the mover of the motion, is, is willing to uh, wait and see if those options are available, because as it stands now, I, I will not support going to the, uh, to the tax stabilization reserve for, for a lot of different reasons, uh, but I would support if he had non-tax levy uh, discretionary uh, revenue sources that he could direct in that way and then bring it back to this body or to a GIC at a future date to potentially explore this uh, for, a, for a short term period of time. Any comment you need for that or have you? No, those are, that, that's just a, that's more of a suggestion to the mover of the motion that he okay. explore anything but this okay. tax stabilization in order to get support from and me I, around this table. And I saw the mover of the motion acknowledge your comments. So, Councillor Partridge, then I'm coming back to Councillor, oh, Councillor, then Councillor Farr, and then I'm coming back to Councillor Johnson for the second time. Councillor Partridge. Yep, thank you, Madam Chair. And um, I really appreciate the uh, previous speaker giving more information about that 2013 because, you know, I, 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 I 
seem to remember it was unanimously supported. We recognized that there was a need. It did include more than just one area of the city, and I think that was the really important part of it. My question, Madam Chair, uh, through you to Marty, is um, McMaster contributing at all to any of the resources that are going into that area at this time? Mr. Hazel. Uh, through the chair, and if you wish detail about the program, Kelly can outline it, but Mac does uh, contribute to Mac 911 peer-to-peer -peer program, so they are contributing currently to some enforcement type of efforts. Thank you, Councillor. Okay, and thank you for that, Madam Chair, because I, I seem to remember when we were discussing that 2013 program that um, there was going to be outreach to the uh, the three institutions, educational institutions, to participate in, in some form. Um, I could be wrong about that, but that was the only question that I had. And, and you know, folks, I say this every time: we have a very difficult budget ahead of us, and the next four months are not going to be pretty. And I I cannot support anything, even you know, it's one hundred and forty dollars, forty thousand dollars. If we get 10 of those, we're at a million dollars. And we have all kinds of little incremental amounts. But I just, I cannot support anything additional going to the 2017 levy. Um, certainly if there was something within the Ward 1 budget um, uh, reserve that could, be, that could be used for this, I think we could take another look at it. But as it is right now, I don't support it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Farr. <coughs> Yeah, it's sort of along the same lines of what the previous speaker is talking about. My boy goes to uh, uh, Mac Sports Camp uh, for two weeks out of each and every summer. And um, there's two ways to drop your kids off for, for the very highly uh, successful Mac Camp in the summertime. One is to go through the maze that is the campus and go all the way around to uh, the Ron B. Joyce Center. Or you can go along the loop on uh, Forsyth and drop them off real quick and haul butt out of there. Well, previous to Councillor Johnson, Councillor McCaddy worked with the 12 or 15 people that actually live on that loop and turned a no parking zone into a no stopping zone, which can be enforced as no stopping within seconds as opposed to, so even stopping for literally two seconds to let a kid out of a car with a hockey stick can get you a pretty sizable ticket. And it appeared to me this year particularly that the new MAC security chief uh, was uh, uh, in an advantageous situation with respect to uh, reaching out to his former colleagues, being Hamilton Police Services, and regularly seeing one or two, usually two, cruisers parked at that no-stopping zone and enforcing parents dropping off their kids and thus avoiding the maze and doing it on a residential street. That's My really point hard. is this, um, and to the point that Councillor Partridge was making, it's clear, at least to me, what I noticed was it, it wasn't hard in this particular circumstance early in the morning to get uh, uh, some friends from Hamilton Police Services to enforce a no-stopping regulation. So why not uh, have a more in-depth conversation with the former chief, Chief DeCare, and see where maybe it's not a budgetary thing where Mac and other people at Mac and not Chief DeCare are, are answering the question as to uh, whether or not they want to partner or not. In this case, they don't. But see, what, what, how has uh, uh, the former chief elevated security in the surrounding neighborhoods? I've seen it for myself in one section, and how might he partner and work with us uh, to a greater capacity on the enforcement side where you know the motion speaks to or the whereas in the motion the original motion speaks to things like noise pollution maybe not property standards but there are other elements where uh, you know he may be we may be in an advantageous situation just by the sheer fact of his former uh, job function so I would encourage uh, the good councillor, I'm supporting this no matter where he intends to go as his seconder and understanding the issues and problems in and around that community and that it is a, it is a, it is a pilot, so it's a non-levy impact. I'm sure it's going to come back with some pretty significant numbers, um, but, but if we're going to hold off, if there's going to be future conversations, that indeed we should talk to the new head of uh, security at Pastor University, because it's clear to me um, he has the ability to reach out to his former colleagues and, and work with uh, other issues outside of MAC, uh, aside from just the foresight loop 
that he uh, is able to enforce regularly with Hamilton Police Services. So, so th that's all I wanted to say because it's a really good point and there's certainly uh, lots of opportunity in just that one aspect, but there's no doubt an issue. This is the good councillor working with several neighbourhood associations trying to do very little in this case to, uh, to um, expand on our, our enforcement uh, uh, opportunities and so I'll, I'll support wherever he intends to go on this. Thank you. Second time, uh, Councillor Johnson. Thanks very much. And uh, based on this feedback, I'm, I am, uh, uh, I'll, I'll use the word happy to table the motion for now so as to work on tweaking it, making it better, making it more passable. And I'd just like to say a couple more things. Uh, colleagues, thanks very much for the, uh, the constructive remarks. Uh, and Councillor Collins, thank you for clarifying some of the history. Um, it is true that we, are, we have a hardworking uh, property standards team and we have hardworking bylaw officers. The consistent feedback that I receive on a daily basis from the McMaster uh, permanent resident neighbors in Ainsleywood and Westdale is that it, it does not feel to the community like there is anything like proactive enforcement in the neighborhoods. Uh, the community consensus is that it is, it is a, I want to say, reactive or even purely reactive protocol that we currently have in terms of bylaw enforcement. On, on paper, it's not that. And sometimes, often enough perhaps in practice, it is not that. You know, at least a few times a year, we do have truly proactive bylaw enforcement in these neighborhoods at the crisis points, when, particularly when the kids are moving out and they dump the cats, the beds, the garbage, the bookshelves, the, the contents of everything onto the front lawns. Like, and, and they party at the same time. So at that kind of late April kind of period, uh, we have certainly proactive bylaw enforcement. But even then, it's kind of the worst time of the year for the neighborhood. What the neighborhoods want to see is, is year-round year activity that they can feel is proactive. So whatever way we can get there, uh, I, I want to get there. Thanks to Councillor Pearson and Councillor Green for going into a related but separate issue of uh, landlord regulation. I'm sure we'll be talking more about that this term of council. This is just about bylaw for now. Thank you to Councillor Farr uh, for referring to Security Director DeCare. I'm very pleased to report I'm in conversation, when I say semi-regularly, I mean authentically semi-regularly. Like <laughs> since his appointment around this time last year, we've met a couple times to chat. And they do what they can, but they don't have the legal power to enforce bylaw. They can go and kind of scare the students by showing up, which they sometimes do. And the, and the, the police work very hard in the community too, showing up when there's noise and that kind of thing. But there's certain things that only a bylaw officer can do. So that's what I'm sort of circling around. I'm happy to table the motion, um, and I, I will go back to McMaster for more conversation. I will go back to my excellent two neighborhood associations for conversation, and to all of you for conversation. Councillor Collins suggested that maybe I can use Ward 1 area rating funding after all through a special motion and permission by council. That may be a solution. So I'm gonna go on canvassing possibilities, and I thank you for your consideration. So, Councillor Farr is going to second my tabling motion, and um, do I have to withdraw? Madam Clerk, please advise what to do. The motion was moved and seconded, so it's up to, it's in committee's purview right now. Okay, so it's for consideration of this, the committee right now, and there's been a suggestion to table this until further research and further um, conversations have happened. So, I know you want to speak second. Is it about the tabling? About the report? Okay, so we'll allow the, the questions about the report and then we'll come back to the tabling. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just a question for staff. I'm just wondering, how did we end up with the report in front of us? Was there direction from the planning committee prior to? If someone could just explain that process to me. Thank you, Marty. So through the chair, there was a motion by Councillor Aiden Johnson in October of this year. Thank you, I appreciate that, and I, and I very much appreciate um, the councillor from Ward 1 looking to table uh, the motion. I support it 100%. Okay, so Ida, we have the motion on the table. We now have a motion to table the motion. So how do we do this procedurally? If committee agrees, uh, you can uh, consider the tabling motion. Thank you. So we're considering the tabling motion. It's moved by Councillor Johnson, second by Councillor Farr. All those in favor to table this motion. Thank you. So the report 5.1, Ida, that was the motion. So the 5.1 report also gets tabled with that. 